and let's get rolling. Okay, so Flash for people who hate Flash. I get it. Um, I was there too, just like Eric said. I hated Flash. I, you know, I thought it was gross. I thought it just looked bad. I thought it was too complicated for me to understand. Um, you know, already shooting in manual mode was enough for my brain to juggle. Um, I'm a professional kids and family photographer, so there's so much going on in front that I could not fathom, you know, choosing to add something else to my process. Um, you know, I also thought that the people who were good with flash, it was just for people who, you know, had these fancy studios and, you know, these seven figure photographers, you know, in Manhattan or Annie Leibovitz. I didn't think it was accessible to someone like me who was photographing my own family and just clients in my own, um, you know, my own city. Um, and, you know, an admission here, I was proud enough to think that I was cool because I could say I was an exclusively natural light photographer. Has anybody else used that? Um, you know, watch me crank up the ISO on this fancy camera and not have too much grain. Um, so, you know, I just avoided flash, right? I, um, I kept it at bay because even though I had all of these excuses for not embracing it, the biggest thing is that I was scared of it, right? Um, because it was just, it was something outside of my comfort zone, but clearly something changed because I'm here with you and we're talking about flash and how much I love it. So I love flash now. And I think hopefully by the end of today, you will too. Um, but the key for me is for you to unlearn all the things that you think you hate about flash. And once we unlearn those things, we can learn about flash in a way that, you know, our natural light loving minds can get on board with, right? Um, you know, when I was trying, when I saw the gap in my work where maybe flash would help me, I went out there and I thought maybe I could teach myself. And so I watched YouTube videos and I sought out lighting di diagrams from photographers I admired. And none of it made sense to me. Because what I found is a lot of the education out there when it comes to flash kind of treats it like a power tool, right? Um, it's, there's nothing wrong with that. If your mind works in a way where it's all just tools and numbers, then great. But for me, I consider myself to be more on the artistic side of photography. I'm an artist. I've been an artist since I was a little kid. Um, so power tools and numbers, it's just not the way my brain works when it comes to photography. So Instead, I wanted an education on flash that treated it like light because I love light. All of us love light, right? We're photographers and photography is all about light. And that's all that flash is. It's light. And so if we love light and we love photography. We can love flash. Um, but, you know, as I tried to find that kind of education out there, I got frustrated because it just didn't exist. And so, um, you know, eventually... I created it myself, and that is what I'm sharing with you today. But, you know, before we get into why we should love Flash and how to love Flash and how to embrace it, let's just like, you know, get the elephant out of the room, right? Um, and talk about the reasons that we do hate Flash, right? You know, you we all have our own reasons, our own personal reasons, maybe that we've been avoiding it. And I've been there. I understand. It was years before I picked up a Flash. Um, so, you know... I'm going to break down some of the reasons I avoided it. Maybe you can relate to these. Flash looks like flash, right? I mean, my poor kid. Um, first of all, I have to say, like, after using flash this long, it was really hard to take a picture with a flash that looked terrible. <laughs> like, I really had to intentionally make it look bad. Um, and this is where we landed, and it's pretty bad, right? Like, but look at his poor little face. He's, like, terrified. <laughs> but... I think so many of us think of flash and we think of that kind of face, right? That's fresh up nose, like, ah, we all know what I'm talking about, right? The harsh shadows, the red pupils, the blown out skin with underexposed backgrounds. I mean, that's all going on in that photo. It's the ugh flash. I mean, you know, I, I remember in college, we had those little disposable cameras with the flash and I thought it was so cool when it went off, like, ooh, it's, we're in like the dark and we can do this, like, or at a wedding when everybody's using those. Um, or maybe even just the pop-up flash on your DSLR. Um, you know, we've all seen it. And some people even use it on purpose. It's kind of in vogue right now. I don't get it. But, you know, it's, it's a thing. 
But for me, even now, I would rather crank up my ISO than have to deal with, and deal with a little bit of grain than have all of my subjects look like they've got like a searchlight on them or look scared or have that scrunched up scared face when I'm aiming the camera at them. But the good news is, is that flash doesn't have to look that way. Obviously it can, but it doesn't have to. Um, and, you know, the longer I've used it, the more I find in my work that it can be hard to tell. And sometimes if I, if I don't keep a record of it, I have to like go back into my EXIF data to see if I used flash or not. Um, and that's pretty exciting, right? That it can look so natural that even I, as the photographer, sometimes forget which photos use flash and which ones don't. You can use flash alongside natural light. You can use it to replicate natural light and the results can be subtle or they can be way over the top. The key of course is to use it intentionally, right? You can use it intentionally bad like I did in that poor photo of my kid. Um, or you can use it intentionally to create whatever kind of light you love. Um, but you know, use it in a way that meets your vision for the final photograph. But we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> The second reason I hated flash was that I thought flash was complicated and maybe you do too. Maybe you think like you see all those buttons, you see all those numbers, you know, you see that remote on top of that camera right there. And you're like, no, no, I don't want anything to do with that. Too much going on, too complicated. And to add to that, maybe I'm making even sound complicated by talking about artistic vision and utilizing flash with intention um, because I haven't told you how to do that yet. Right. We're getting there. I promise. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that flash doesn't have to be complicated at all. Sometimes we just are silly and make it complicated because flash is light and we've been using light all this time. The minute we picked up a camera, we've been using light. So we've got this. And light, when you boil it down, is just science and math, which I mean, okay, like, full admission when I hear science and math, like I want to run, like I graduated, <laughs> please don't make me go back to science and math. I like to be artist, Kelly. It sounds scary at first, but here's the good thing about science and math. Science and math are constant and they are predictable, which means that light, no matter where it's coming from, whether it's the sun, whether it's a flashlight, whether it's an iPad or this ring light on top of my you know, computer right now, or the fanciest pro photo strobes out there, light always acts the same way. It is completely predictable. Com it's always acting the same way because it's based in science and math. So all you need to do as a photographer is get a grasp of the science of light, and then you'll have everything you need to make flash work for you. And luckily, the science of light can be broken down into just five variables, and I've got them listed here. It's the size, the direction, the distance, the shape, and the color. And once we're done talking about why we might hate flash, we're gonna dive into those variables. Um, and by manipulating those five things, you truly can create any light you can imagine. The other reason I hated flash, or another reason, not the other reason, um, I didn't think flash was necessary, right? Again, my camera, I can crank up the ISO to 6400 and it doesn't look terrible. The equipment we have is amazing and that's a good thing. Um, and so I, I made it so that I didn't need flash, right? There was always a workaround. Um, and you know, for years I took pictures that I love without flash. I still take pictures that I love without flash of my kids and my clients and anything else in front of me. Um, but here's the deal, since I added flash, it's made my life a whole lot easier. Um, you know, and maybe, I mean, I guess this is California, right? I'm in Ohio, but in California, maybe you've got all this beautiful sun all the time that's golden and perfect. Um, but you know, in Ohio, the sun disappears altogether for like half of the year. Um, and even when it's here, there's a chance it's gonna be overcast and gray. Um, and maybe for you, all of those memorable moments happen in golden hour or in whatever kind of light you love most. Um, but my kids, they do like the cutest things in the middle of the day and they do really adorable things at night when there is no sun. And as a photographer who photographs my own family, I still want to capture those memories beautifully. Um, and as a business person, I don't want to limit my business to just a few hours of a day. Being able to open up 
my schedule to different times of day because I can control the light with flash has made it so that my business has an opportunity to earn more um, and has given me an opportunity to work around other things in my schedule rather than having to block off those prime time hours. Um, and you know, even if you do live in California, which is my favorite place, um, and it's perpetually golden hour and it's magical and never rainy, I think that you might eventually want to add some variety to your work. And understanding the science of light will help you add that variety. And understanding the science of light will help you harness the sun with intention too. So while flash might not be necessary to take a photo, right? We don't need it. I would argue that it can be extremely valuable in helping you take pictures that more consistently make you proud that um, it helps you take ownership of just another element of this photographic process. Um, you know, just like shooting in manual mode, taking control of that exposure triangle, taking control of your shutter speed and your aperture, those things help you create the images that are in your imagination as an artist. I would argue that understanding light will transform you for the better as an artist as well. And another reason to hate flash is that flash is too expensive. And, you know, I mean, I could sit here and be like, well, flashes come at all different price points and even pro photo, you know, the top of the line, you can, you know, you can start with this flash and then go all the way up to that flash. There's a range. But the fact of the matter is, is that flash isn't cheap. I get it. Um, I'm getting ready to send a kid off to college. Believe me, I get having a budget. <laughs> and, you know, there's not a lot in photography that lasts for very long that is cheap. And I have a side story here for you when I was, I mean, gosh, 12 years ago when I was telling my husband um, that I wanted a DSLR, one of my selling points <laughs> was that we're going to save so much money because I'm not going to be hiring a professional photographer anymore um, to do our Christmas cards. I would be able to do it. Um, and we have saved no money with me being a photographer, quite the opposite. <laughs> I, I hope, I bet some of you can relate to that as well. Okay. Done with my side story. However, there's some really great flash hacks that can make the cost of adding flash to your setup a little bit less painful. And I will be sharing those with you today as well. Um, I use them all the time, even though I've, you know, accumulated and built up a pretty um, stellar flash arsenal. Um, I love a good DIY hack. And um, I use them all the time because they don't just save money, but they work beautifully. So, the key is to remember that no matter what flash you have, it's light and light always works within those parameters of the science of light. So as long as you understand light, which by the end of our hour, you'll be one step closer. You can make any light source work for you. So now that we've talked about all the reasons I hated flash and maybe some of the reasons you've hated flash, uh, let's talk about why I fell in love with flash. Um, you know, I already talked about the biggest reason why I didn't love Flash is because I didn't understand it. Um, I was scared of it. I was frustrated by it, frustrated by my own limited knowledge of it. And it wasn't until someone presented Flash to me in a way that empowered me to use it myself that I started to feel that fear dissipate, right? Um, I think a lot of times we watch people do demonstrations with photography and with lighting where they just make it look so easy, like they just do it. And we're like, okay, they can do that because they're awesome. I couldn't do that. And for me, it took someone putting a flash in my hands and saying, you do this, it's your turn. And they kind of forced me to do it that I felt as though just maybe I could overcome my own insecurities when it came to lighting. And it was that spark of empowerment, right? That led to the realization that flash could actually make my life easier, that I could do this, that it didn't have to be complicated. It didn't have to be flashy. Um, and from there, I found that flash wouldn't just make my life easier, but it would open the door to all of those new artistic opportunities and possibilities. And once I got over it, got over myself, right? Once I listened to somebody who told me I could do it, I completely fell in love with flash and I haven't looked back since. Okay, so let's dig in the science of light. So hopefully I have you feeling a little less alone in your hatred of flash. Um, really, I'm, 
I want you to feel a little bit hopeful that maybe if I could learn Flash, you can do. Um, so it's time to convince you that all of those reasons for hating Flash are wrong. Um, and the key to proving them wrong is proving just how simple light is to control. It's just five little variables, five little things that you need to remember that you can control and take your time with when creating light. And if the science of light seems intimidating, consider this. Everything you do as an artist has a foundation in science and math. Um, and again, I know this as an artist, and yet I often ignore it. I let the creativity take over, but it's still all science and math. Fibonacci spiral, the exposure triangle, depth of field, color theory. We are perpetually employing science and math in our photography, where we become artists is when we translate those scientific and mathematical concepts into emotionally impactful imagery, right? It's when we act as the translator for our audience and take that science and math and make it have a narrative, make it say something to the people looking at our photos. And you can and should do the same with light. When you understand how to create light, you're better able to manipulate light, no matter where it's coming from, to create better art. It's just another way to speak to your audience. So we'll go back to those five variables, right? It's size, the size of your light source, the direction your light is coming from, the distance of the light from your subject in the background, the shape of your light, and the color of your light. That's all we need to consider. So let's, let's go, ready? Okay, so the size. The size of your light is going to affect the hardness and softness of the shadows. So a bigger light source creates soft shadows, while a smaller light source creates harder shadows. Now, there's oftentimes like a misconception on what hard light and soft light are. Like people always think like midday sun is going to be hard light, and it is, um, but there's a lot of other variables at play there, right? Um, also, people are like, how is the sun? Like it's a very big light source. How is that hard light? Um, it's small in the sky, right? It's just like this big when you look at it in the sky. So it's actually a small light source in relation to your subject. But so here, let's define softness and hardness, right? So a soft shadow is when the penumbra, which is the transition between the highlights and the shadows. I've got to throw a little bit of Latin out to you guys. I took way too many years of Latin not to use it. So penumbra is just when that transition is very gradual. So soft means that like going from highlights to shadows is like a smooth transition, right? It's fuzzy. A hard shadow is when that transition is more abrupt, right? You can see a line between the light, the highlights and the shadows. So you can make your light source bigger or smaller with modifiers such as soft boxes or by bouncing your light off of other surfaces. So these two photos, while um, on different subjects and in different locations, use the same lighting pattern. However, the main difference is the size of the light source, right? So you can see like they both have this little like triangle underneath their eyes. It's that Rembrandt style light. Um, but you can see the shadow on the uh, underwater photographers. This is actually Elizabeth Blank. She's a friend of mine. She's an amazing underwater photographer. Follow her, she's cool. Um, but that shadow, you can see there's a line where that her nose is casting that shadow on her cheek, right? It's a hard light um, and it's a smaller light source, right? This is the Profoto A1X, just held off camera. Um, and that creates a hard light because it's a small light source. Um, but by contrast, the bottom photo uses a larger light source, right? This is a Profoto B10 with a two foot beauty dish attached. So it goes from this like small circle all the way to a big two foot circle. And that creates a softer shadow. So that shadow that is cast by his um, nose onto his cheek, it's fuzzy, right? It's a soft shadow. Um, and again, the other variables are relatively the same when it comes to the light, right? Like the exposure is the same, um, the direction of the light's the same, but it's just the hardness or softness of the shadows by changing the size of the light source. Um, what I want you to consider as someone who might modify your light by changing the size of it is about why you would choose a particular size of light for certain subjects. Why would you choose a smaller light source for the underwater photographer than you would for the little kid. Um, so, you know, I'm going to talk a lot tonight about using science, the science of light with intention, but I think it's worth diving into that a little bit more. Um, you know, 
perhaps you want to change the size of your light to cre recreate a real life scenario, right? Um, so think about how different sunlight looks when it comes like filtering through a window, as opposed to shining a flashlight on someone's face, right? That creates two different, very, two very different qualities of shadows, right? Um, Think about the difference between midday sunny day shadows and overcast cloudy day shadows, right? Those clouds are like adding a giant soft box to the sun. So it makes it the whole sky now is your light source instead of just that itty bitty sun, right? Um, so when you want to recreate those lighting conditions in your own work, you're gonna have to change the size of your light in order to do so. So if you want it to look like it's overcast, you're gonna need a really big light source. If you want to look like want it to look like it's noon on the beach, you're going to need to recreate that light source by having a smaller light source. But beyond just recreating natural light, beyond just getting a look, um, think about how light can evoke a mood, right? Um, you know, consider how harder shadows might change a face, right? Um, hard shadows intensify wrinkles and blemishes, right? Because you get those shadows, harder shadows. It doesn't get fuzzy, right? It doesn't blend them into the face. It defines them. Um, it creates geometry with a defined nose shadow. And then when you soften those things, you get less geometry. You get, you smooth out blemishes or wrinkles. Um, so how might a viewer react differently to two different versions of that subject, right? Um, and not just the viewer, but also the subject. How do you want the subject to see themselves? Um, so, you know, the science of light can be translated for practical purposes, but also it can be translated into emotion. And that just gives us more tools as artists to work with. <laughs> My little guy, good soft shadows for a soft, snuggly moment. The next variable is the direction of the light. So the direction of the light is going to affect the placement of the highlights and the direction and size of the shadows, right? And we talked about this with the size of the light with, you know, Elizabeth and my son. Um, it was the same direction, just different sizes, but those shadows were going in the same direction. The highlights were in the same places on their faces. And, you know, I think a lot of times we talk about good light or bad light, but I would argue that there's no such thing as good light or bad light necessarily. It comes more down to, you know, good shadows or bad shadows. And beyond that, it comes down to intentionally used light and unintentionally used light. Because the direction of light source can exaggerate facial features. It can minimize imperfections. It can, you know, make your memory go back to like those old Hollywood glamour photos, um, or it can create a monster. Um, and when you get to pick which direction your light's coming from, you get to choose exactly what you want to see or not see on your subject. Oh, why? oh, there we go. Okay, my screen froze. So both of these photos are of my husband, who is obviously a very patient, supportive man. Um, and there are a lot of variables at play here, right? But take special note of the direction of the light and how that changes his face. You know, like, yes, my costuming and makeup skills are stellar for this Frankenstein photo. However, I would argue that it's not the green makeup that makes him look like Frankenstein. It's not the green makeup that makes him go from being like handsome cowboy Mr. Beezer to scary monster Mr. Beezer, right? It is the direction of the light. It's where those shadows are falling on his face, where that shadow is falling behind him on the wall that truly transforms, transforms him from a guy in a costume to embodying the character, right? So, you know, the placement of those highlights and shadows can be a powerful tool in not only revealing and concealing features, but also in like conveying and creating a personality. And both of these are used with the same exact light, just coming from different directions. It's just pro photo held up here. And in the Frankenstein photo, he's holding the pro photo um, below his chin. Um, again, the direction of the light can truly transform face. So, why, right? Can you tell I was like the kid who always asked my parents why over and over again? I still am that person. <laughs> so why would you change the direction of your light source? Um, 
you know, you might change it to match the visible light sources in your frame, right? There's a window on the left side of the frame, but it's not giving enough light to illuminate your subject. You know, you can add a light with it to make it look like it's the window light, but it's really your flash coming through, right? You can see the window in the frame and there's just extra light coming in. I put a, I put a flash outside of windows all the time to do that. Um, you know, if there's a lamp, put a flash by it and just make it come from the same direction, right? Um, you know, likewise, you can use flash to fill in your shadows. That window on the left may be enough to be the main light to illuminate your subject, but you find that the other side of their face is too dark. You don't want it to look so contrasty. So a flash can be positioned on the right to add just a little extra light to bring back the detail in those shadows, right? While still allowing that window light to be the main source. You can use light direction for very practical purposes. But again, I would argue that light and the direction of your light can go beyond, you know, technical execution. The direction of light can create shadows that speak to the emotions of your subject and evoke those emotions from your audience, right? Consider like how the direction of light changes your perception of Mr. Weezer in those examples, right? I think, I think honestly, if you put those two pictures next to each other, some people might not be able to tell it's the same person. Light is a powerful artistic tool. And when you use it with intention, there's no such thing as good or bad light, right? It's all light based on your vision. And I think that's really, really cool. So again, this is a flash used right outside that window. Um, you know, just to call myself out here, he wasn't actually supposed to be sleeping in this photo. It just took me so long to set up my camera for a self-portrait and the remote and the light that he fell asleep. <laughs> but I like the uh, end product anyway. So moving on to the next variable of light. The distance of the light will determine the brightness of the background. And this is where we're gonna have to put like our math hats on just a little bit. I promise I'm here to walk you through it. <laughs> um, the amount of light that hits an object is governed by something called the inverse square law. Um, if you've never heard of that before, it is a great thing to know because it's a little trick that you can use to create all kinds of results in your photographs, right? And it looks like this. Light equals one over distance squared. So light is the inverse of the distance squared from the subject. So that means that the amount of light reaching an object is inversely proportional to the squared distance of the light from the object. Y'all got it, right? We can move on to the next variable. No, no, we should illustrate it. Let's do this. Okay, so let's break it down even more. Because again, just looking at those numbers, it's like, boom, like right over my head. So let's say that I have Annie, my daughter, positioned two feet from my light. And there's a backdrop behind her that's eight feet away. So by the inverse square law, that means one fourth of the light's power is hitting Annie, right? Because one over two squared is one fourth, right? So one fourth of the light's power is hitting Annie. And one sixty fourth of the light's power is hitting the backdrop. Right? That's just plugging those numbers into that formula. Therefore, Annie is being hit with 16 times more light than the backdrop. So 16 more light, 16 times more light is quite a bit more, right? She is going to appear much brighter than the background. But now I'm going to move Annie. I'm going to move her so that she's just one foot away from the backdrop. That means that the light now is eight feet away from the backdrop and seven feet away from Annie. So plugging those numbers into that formula, 1 49th of the light's power is hitting my subject and 1 64th of the light's power is hitting the backdrop. So now Annie's only being hit with 1.3 times more light than the backdrop. So before she was being hit with 16 times more light, 16 times the power of the light was hitting my subject. But now it's just 1.3 times more light. So the backdrop isn't that much darker than Annie. So in the first scenario, right, she's getting so much more light. In the second scenario, not so much more. And we've illustrated it right here. So we took these photos of her for a Valentine's Day card. And I think it's the perfect illustration of how distance of the light can change the appearance of the background. This is just a white seamless paper, right? And by changing how close Annie is to the background and the light is to Annie, it transformed that background from white to gray to almost black within a matter of seconds. These were all taken just boom, boom, boom just moving her in the light. 
Um, so in a studio setting, this is like really helpful in saving on colors of seamless paper. Like I'm saving you money, hooray. Um, you all need to write Mr. Luther and tell him that I'm saving money <laughs> when it comes to photography. But when shooting in real life situations, you can significantly impact the atmosphere of the photo by changing where your lights in relation to your subject. So why would you change the distance of your light source, right? Um, just like all the other variables of light, it can greatly impact the technical integrity of your final image, as well as the artistic clarity of the final image. If you're trying to recreate the sun, it really won't make much sense to have a light super close to your subject with the background far away and underexposed. Like if you remember that photo I took of my son at the very beginning, the bad flash photo, right? That does not look like sunlight because the background's so dark and he's so much brighter. The sun illuminates everything in its path, right? So you're going to want the whole scene to be relatively equally exposed. If you're trying to recreate the light of a campfire, it makes perfect sense to have the flash close to your subject, right? With everything else underexposed, because that's how it looks by a campfire, right? But on the artistic side of things, how much does environmental context add or detract from your story, right? Do you want to isolate your subject with light? Or do you want to have like the whole scene lit to give your audience clues as to what you want to say about your subject? Do I want to hide the messy room by just limiting my subject? Or do I want to like let everybody see the mess that is, you know, kind of like the story of my life with all these kids at home? The distance of your light will be what makes these choices possible. So it's both that technical execution and the opportunity for artistic choices with your light variables. Right, so um, this photo is with the Profoto A1X as well. And this is taken in my yard in the middle of the day. All I did is I put that flash really close to Annie. And, you know, the tree line is far away. And I exposed for her and everything else fades to black. And the kid looks like a force of nature, right? She has overtaken nature. The flash has overtaken nature. And for me, making that choice um, helps speak to that, that side of her personality that much more. My little hurricane. <laughs> hey, Kelly. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, but there oh, is a question and sure. I wanted to see if you can answer. So somebody asked a little bit ago, so I know you've kind of moved on a little bit, but you were talking about, you were using the beauty dish. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that might've been with your son, but I can't remember. Yep. Um, they want to know, can you explain the beauty dish a little bit more, please? Yes, um, the beauty dish is my favorite Profoto light modifier. Um, so it's, um, it's a round modifier. I have a two foot beauty dish. Um, and Eric, you're gonna be mad at me because I actually don't know what the little thing inside of it's called. Oh, the, the, diffuser, the diffuser plate? Is that what yeah, you're referring to? the diffuser to? plate. I just call it the little circle thing inside. <laughs> that also works, yes. <laughs> you know, because I'm a legend of light, it's the little circle thing. Oh, um, of course, absolutely. <laughs> Um, again, I'm just going to stay humble here. Um, but what that does is it allows light to bounce off of that. It just creates, again, it's a diffuser plate. It diffuses the light that much more. And, um, you know, for me, I love the effect of it. It's, um, it just lights a face so beautifully. We're going to talk about shape of light right now. That's what's up. Um, but I love that circular shape. It creates the most beautiful catch lights. Um, and, Again, it's, I mean, it's called a beauty dish for a reason. It just, it does a really good job of lighting a face for a portrait. Um, it's, it's, again, just the perfect size for a face. Um, that being said, I find that people either love it or hate it. And um, I am just in the camp that loves it. But that being said, I also love all the modifiers. I have everything from a five foot octobox um, down to like some super skinny strip lights and I use it all. Um, but yeah, that's what a beauty dish is. I love the OCF modifiers that you can fold up. That's all I actually own. Um, they fold up real small and I can put them in a backpack um, and hop on an airplane with them or go out to a session and haul them by myself. So does that answer the question, I hope? Well, that, that was awesome. Thank you, Kelly. There is a follow-up, uh, sure. of course. Why would they hate the beauty dish? If they would love it, that's great. But why would they hate it? Because they're crazy. No, um, <laughs> okay. no I mean... I'm not sure why somebody would hate it, but I, people have very strong opinions on the beauty dish. Um, I'm not sure if they just don't like the fall off, like maybe they're people who like, like more body in the photos and there's some fall off because of the relatively smaller size of it. Um, 
yeah, I don't know why someone had hit it because again, I think it creates the most beautiful catch lights and um, yeah, it just, it's like the softness of it is just perfect for pretty much any face. I've used it on, you know, people from six to 96 and I just think it's gorgeous. Um, but yeah, I just think it just like with anything, right? Like some people like shooting with wide angle lenses. Some people prefer telephoto. Some people like the 35 while others swear by the 50. It's just one of those things where the more you use them, the more you find what works for your style. Um, and I think that's the same with modifiers. Awesome. I think that explains it really well. And I, and just to interject real quick, I think, um, too, what happens is people, you know, they try and use that tool and they might try and not do just a headshot and two or three people and they back that beauty dish up and it, yep. then it really isn't a beauty dish and it really doesn't do what it's designed to do. Right. And I, and that's what I've heard too. So. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's just it. It's, I mean, yeah. I use it for just like traditional, not traditional headshots, but like strict headshots. Right. Um, I would never use it for a full body shot. Um, just because again, it's just a little guy up there. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, you know, and again, it's about using those things with intention and understanding what the modifier is going to do. Um, highly recommend if um, you're near a store where there's good rentals, um, renting modifiers and just experimenting with them is super fun and also kind of helps you figure out what works best for you. So that is my two cents on the beauty dish. I actually have a big light stand set up right now with the beauty dish on it. So it's a good time to talk about it. Okay, so let's move on to the shape of light. So the shape of the light is going to affect the shape of the catch lights and the shape of that penumbra we talked about earlier, which is the shape of that graduation from highlights to shadows. So just to be perfectly honest, my mom is never going to zoom in on a photo to look at the shape of the catch lights in her grandkids' eyes, right? She's just going to look at those sweet faces and be happy with them, right? Um, however, if you are trying to recreate a specific light source, it will be much more believable if you replicate the shape of that light source. So think like rectangular modifiers for a window. If you're trying to replicate a window, unless you have a circular window, you're going to want to use a rectangular modifier. Um, and you know, a circular modifier for the sun. Um, it just makes sense, right? That you'd want to replicate the shape. Are most people going to pay attention? Maybe not, but they might subconsciously know that something's up and not be able to put their finger on it. And for me, I take great pride in people not being able to tell if it's flash or not in my work. So in addition to affecting the catch lights, the shape of your light will affect that penumbra. So a circular light will create an even penumbra, while an oblong light will create a softer penumbra in the direction that's longer and a harder penumbra in the direction that's shorter or smaller, which makes sense, right? It's a smaller light source this way and a bigger light source this way. So the penumbra is going to be softer and harder based on where that light source is bigger and smaller. Um, it also makes sense why I like that beauty dish because with that even penumbra, I, you know, it's evenly diffusing um, any blemishes or any wrinkles. Um, I really like a beauty dish when I've got to do my own headshots. <laughs> um, but if nothing else, the shape of your light source is something to play with. And it's something to look for in the work of others. One of my favorite things to do um, is flip through magazines and especially the ads for like, um, like fashion houses um, and try to decode what light sources they used and what modifiers they used. It's a great exercise um, so that you can more intuitively pick which modifiers might be good for you and see who's cheating. <laughs> So do I think this mom is going to zoom in on the catch lights in her kid's eyes? No, of course she's not. However, for me as the photographer, I'm zooming in on their eyes. I'm checking to make sure it's the same kind of light source. So no matter the pose or the emotion or which subjects are in the frame, it's just one extra thing to make that session more cohesive. Something that when those photos are up on this family's wall, it's not gonna look like something might be off in one of the photos, right? They all are using the same shape light source, the same direction. Um, so something as simple as the shape of a modifier can help me to create that thread of connection between a whole set of images, no matter how different the actual scene is. And finally, we're going to talk about the color of the light. So the color of the light will cast colors on your subject and will determine how well your subject blends into the existing light situation. So, you know, like at different times of day, 
light has different color temperatures, right? Like right now it's dusk here. So it's very blue outside. Um, 15 minutes ago, it was like orange outside my window. Um, so, you know, if you're photographing your subject at the end of the day in golden hour, you might want to add warmth to your flash to match the warmth of the sun. If you're trying to fake golden hour, you might want to add warmth to your flash. If you're shooting in a room with fluorescent lights, like, first of all, I'm sorry, that's the worst. Um, but also you might want to add green to your flash to neutralize the green of those existing lights. When you had green to your flash, the light on your subject will have canceled out what's going on above. But I really hope you don't have to shoot in fluorescent lights. So again, a uh, high school senior um, in golden hour, orange gel every time. Um, this actually wasn't golden hour, we faked it. And Mr. Beezer's somewhere in those wildflowers getting spiders all over him. It was, it was, it was a trip. <laughs> but that orange gel makes it look like it's golden hour. But you know, light, the color of light doesn't just have to be matching the existing light. It doesn't have to be replicating a natural light situation, right? You know I'm gonna say this. It can be used creatively. You can combine gels to create colorful highlights and shadows. You can use color to signal emotion. And you know, the science of color alone, like beyond light, the science of color is fascinating. And our cultural connections to colors um, is just another way to translate the emotion we want our audience to feel um, through our photography. So while there are rules and laws that define light, there are no rules or laws to how you apply the science of light to your own work, right? In fact, I would urge you to learn the variables of light and then use them to break all the rules. I love a good rule breaker because that's where being an artist is fun. And honestly, that's where we get to advance what photography is, right? Like if we all just follow the rules, we, all of our photos would look the same. When we start breaking the rules and we start breaking them with intention, that's when we kind of move this craft forward. That's when we make people think outside of what they know and reconsider what the rules are. Um, so have fun being an artist, have fun breaking the rules. But then when I ask you why you broke the rules, be able to answer confidently. So why would you change the color of your light source, right? Like I said, with every variable and truly every variable we have at our disposal behind the camera, right? even your exposure triangle, um, even if you're gonna use a tripod or not, like all of those variables, um, it can impact our technical and creative success. Um, you know, the color flash could be used to correct the color of the existing light, that horrible fluorescent light. Um, it can match a color existing in nature. It can connect our subjects and our viewers to emotions or memories. Think about, um, you know, memories of being in golden hour, like, right? Like I think of like long walks with my husband, especially this past year when we were all stuck and like we were in our little bubbles. Um, Mr. Bees and I started taking walks at golden hour every night together just to get out of the house. And um, you know, there are memories now attached to that color of light. Um, and you can connect people to their own memories by um, replicating that in your work with flash. But again, the key to consider with color is to be unafraid to experiment with anything in your photography, be unafraid. Failure is something to be celebrated because it brings us one step closer to being a success, right? Um, which I think is awesome. I love failing um, because again, it means I'm, I'm trying something new. And again, while I was so scared of flash before, now I'm like, ooh, what can I fail at this time? Because again, that initial failure, that initial fear led me into something that has totally transformed my art and that's exciting. So experiment with color, experiment with, um, you know, everything. Uh, and just to clear this up, because people generally ask this question, what's, what is that substance behind her? It's actually just fake snow from a craft store. You can get it from Amazon for like $2 for a giant bag that you'll find in your home for the rest of time. It's like glitter, but worse maybe. Um, and all I did is I had um, my son throw it behind her and I had the flash positioned you know, behind her as well with a blue gel on it. And he threw it between her and the flash and then it fired and it created this awesome like glittery backlight that I think turned her in, you know, into a Star Wars character rather than just being a kid in a costume. We like costumes around here. <laughs> so um, I know we are in a time crunch tonight, but um, should you want this program, there are videos um, that you can have 
they're all yours and you can find them on my Shutter and Glass Vimeo page if you just want to go seek them out that way. Um, I'm not going to share them with you tonight because I've got everything written in the PDF, um, but I do shooting demonstrations for you for to show you how these variables all work. And I have different hair. <laughs> okay, so in that video, you'll see that, um, you know, a, this is talking about the hardness and softness of the light, right? So a smaller light is going to create a harder shadow. So you can see in this top photo here, right? Like I've got this little light source aimed directly at the spiky little plant. And you can see the outline of that plant on that whiteboard behind it, right? But then when I bounce the light source, so I talked about this earlier, but you can add modifiers to your light, right? Um, in fact, the A1X recently, Profoto came out with like a OCF adapter for the A1X, which is amazing. Um, I've been asking for it for years and it's the coolest thing ever. Um, but it allows you to add those OCF modifiers to your A1. But if you don't have one of those at your disposal, or you don't have, the, if you're in a situation where you don't have the time to add that, you can bounce the light. And that's what I did here. You just bounce the light off of another surface. So instead of the light source being this itty bitty circle, it's now a much bigger circle. And that's going to create a bigger light source, which is going to have softer shadows. So now instead of this, you know, defined outline of that spiky plant, it's super fuzzy and just barely mimics the shape of the plant. Um, so, you know, demonstrating a very easy way to control the size of your light source, no matter which light you're using. And then also in that video, you'll see how adjusting the distance of your light affects the background, right? So in this top photo, I have light very close to the subject and the plant is pulled away from that white backdrop. And so with that, the backdrop appears, it's not white anymore, it's like a dark gray. Um, but all I did is I moved, I kept the light in the same exact spot and I just moved that plant back closer to the backdrop. So now, you know, the difference between the power of the light hitting those two things is much less. Um, so with the subject farther from the light, the background appears to be lighter, it's white now. And again, that's just a very, that video might be five minutes long. And I got all of those different results just adjusting those variables very quickly. Um, so I want you to think of, you know, you might not be taking pictures of a spiky little plant in your kitchen, but how quickly you could change the appearance of the, your subject, how quickly you can get variety in a session just by changing those two variables. So flash in real life. So science and math are cool when you're in a lab, right? Or when you're photographing that stationary plant in a controlled setting. Um, but for me, like, again, I specialize in kids and family photography, which I like to think of as the most joyful chaos ever. Um, adding flash to that is a little more challenging, right? Is, you know, and for a long time, I questioned, is there a place for flash in that? Um, but you know my answer. <laughs> and, you know, how do you keep flash from looking like flash? So, you know, I, um, I want you to take out into the wild, right? I love a good golden hour session and I love dreamy sunsets and everything that natural light has to offer. But I want you to take a minute to think about how you have to edit that in that situation, right? If you're depending only on natural light. Um, I love gorgeous backlight. I think it's, again, beautiful. I love that rim light. I love those fiery skies. And when I'm shooting that, I, you know, I put the subject right where I want her. And I want to keep the skies properly exposed, right? Um, so I pull those photos up. And if I've got my subject properly exposed in a backlit photo, right, I'm going to have a very underexposed subject. If I want to keep the detail in that sky, that sunset sky, that exposure is going to be so much brighter that my subject is going to be underexposed. So it's a very simple fix, right? I just bring it into camera raw. And or if you're a Lightroom user, you just bring it to Lightroom and you just pull up the shadows and keep your fingers crossed that there's not too much grain. Um, hooray for dynamic range. Um, but what if you didn't have to do that? What if you could use light to keep your subject and the sky properly exposed? What if you used flash like a Lightroom slider? And that's exactly how I want you to think of flash in this real life situation. It's just a real life shadow slider. You're still getting exposed for the sky, right? So what I do is I go out there and I take a photo of my I take a photo of my subject exposing for the sky. So my subject still looks underexposed. I've not even turned the flash on. 
And then once I've got that sky looking just the way I want it, I turn on the flash to bring up the exposure only on my subject. Because of the distance of that sky from, from my subject, none of the light's going to illuminate that, right? It's kind of like the mom who has the flash on when she's in the auditorium and her kid's up on stage thinking the flash is somehow gonna reach her child. No, the flash does not reach that far. It's diminished so much by then that you just, it's, you can't see it. Um, none of that light is going to reach the clouds in the sky. Your skies will stay properly exposed, right? The light is only going to affect your subject. So, you know, take a picture and look at the back of your camera. I love a good chimping moment. Um, do you like how bright your subject is? If not, just change the power of the flash, right? So if the subject's too bright, just bring down the power a little bit. And if the subject's not bright enough, just bring up the power a little bit. All you're going to be doing is changing the exposure on your subject. Get the exposure right where you want it. And once you have that, then you just get to use those five variables of light to get the exact results you want. So if you want the light to be softer, you change the size of the light. If you want the light to be warmer to match the sun, you change the color. If you want to match, you know, the direction of the sun to the light and the visible light sources and seeing, you just change the placement of your light. It's as simple as that. So you expose for the background and then you add light onto your subject. And here's an illustration of just that. So on the photo on the left, they were uh, these two photos were taken within seconds. You the photo on the left, she's dark and underexposed. And it's honestly like kind of cool on her, right? Um, I liked the way the trees looked. I liked the gold of the sun behind her. Um, I was happy with the background, but I was not happy with how she looked. And honestly, even if I did pull up the shadows, I, the light wouldn't be super interesting on her face. It would just kind of be flat. And I like good directional light on a face. I like to see it look three-dimensional. So by adding a single light with an orange gel off camera, I was able to add the gold that I saw in that sun onto her. Um, and I was able to add dimension to her face. And I was able to add the exposure to her that I would want to see with the shadow slider, but without sacrificing image quality. And Again, for me personally, this matches like how I see my daughter when she goes to get eggs from our chickens, right? It's beautiful and it's warm. It's a warm memory for me. So having using the light to match that memory for me makes this image just that much more powerful emotionally and not just technically. Flash outside could even be used more dramatically though. Um, just like I want to expose for that sunset sky with Annie and the eggs, I can also make the outside totally disappear into darkness using the same concepts, right? But instead of exposing for the sky or exposing for the background, I intentionally underexpose the background. And then all I have to do is add light to illuminate the subject. Um, just like in that force of nature photo that I shared with you, that is what I did there. I underexposed the background. And I kept it super close to her so that only she was illuminated. Um, and again, should you reach out and ask for that PDF, you will have access to this video um, where I do an outdoor flash demonstration with my little one. And here are the results from that shooting session. Um, you know, with no flash, the photo on the left, I'm dependent upon the sun, right? Um, I don't have any control over any of those variables of light. It's like whatever the sun's doing that day, which it was kind of just flat and overcast that day, that's what I've got to live with. Um, but in the second photo, the one on the right, um, I can set the exposure for the background first and then add light only to him to get the light pattern on him that I want. Um, you know, and when you watch the video, you'll see me work very quickly because again, he's outside and he wants to play. He does not want to be a part of, you know, this class. I mean, no offense, but he's got, you know, trucks to play with. <laughs> um, that being said, even working quickly, working rushed with the attention span of a six-year-old, I'm pretty thrilled with the results we got from a single handheld light. Again, in the video, you'll see nine times out of 10, if I'm using a flash, I'm holding it in my own hand. It's, I call it my shoulder workout. Um, and you can see, I just hold it out here, or I guess in this photo, I was holding it out here. I might've flipped it um, <laughs> and got the exposure where I wanted it on him after exposing for that background. But if I was able to do this that quickly, think of all the cool things you could do playing with other variables of light when you have a subject who's gonna sit still longer, when you aren't shooting a video and have more time to really consider those variables. Um, I think it's always so exciting when you can take more control and um, get results that other people might not see. And that's the best part of being a photographer, right? I love 
when I have a client who looks at the back of my camera or looks at their final photographs and says, oh my gosh, how did you see that there? Um, as photographers, we get to see the world differently. Um, we get to see it like the camera sees it. And revealing that to people is probably the greatest joy in what I do. Um, letting them see just how amazing they are and how amazing just like general life is. I think that's a really beautiful gift that we have. Um, and when we approach photography that way, um, I think it's, again, it's just, it's an amazing thing to be able to do for a living, right? Letting people see the best of themselves um, is pretty cool. That's my mushy moment for you today. So, hey, Kelly, pretty- just a, um, <laughs> want to interrupt you one more time. Sorry, but uh, just a two minute warning for you. Oh, we were getting no. close to time. I know it, it's crazy Stop. how time flies, of course. <laughs> okay. Okay. No, I will take go your quickly. time, but just, just letting you know. I appreciate that two minute warning. I would have gone all night long. Um, Okay, so let's bring the party inside and I'm gonna talk even faster than I've been talking this whole time. Is there a room in your house that you hate minus the basement? The light down there is terrible all the time. Um, Or is there a room in your house where you wish you could take pictures but you never do because it's a windowless dungeon? My basement. Um, You know, or the worst situation of all is when you walk into a house for an in-home session or into a wedding venue and you know it's gonna have to be green because you've got to crank up the ISO because the light is terrible. I don't think a photographer should ever be limited by location, right? Because we have flash. So I created another video for you that you can access when you get the PDF, um, where you can see how flash can be used in any room to create better results. So if you want to create a tiny window for dramatic light, you can create a window, right? Flash can be used like your own portable window. Um, So it could be a tiny little window. It can be a big bay of windows. or it can add an extra window where you wish there was one in a room. Um, The key here is to put your flash right where you would want that window and use the variables of light to make that window just what you would want to see in camera. So here's the video. We'll skip ahead to where I show you the results, right? So we have no flash, right? Then we did bad flash where it's just on the camera aimed straight at the subject. You can even see its reflection in the window, not the great results. Here's the flash bounced off the camera or bounced off the ceiling, still on camera. You can already see we're getting better. It's relatively flat light, but it's good and it's soft and everything's evenly illuminated. Flash is still on the camera in this one, but just bounced off a wall, camera left. Now we've got good directional light. But then we took it off camera. We bounced it next, we bounced it off of a whiteboard. So I created a window using that whiteboard as if the windows behind him wrapped around him. And I call the elephant him like he's like a living thing. This is a scenario where my kids were not willing to participate in the video. So we used a stuffed animal. And then finally, we did flash off camera, bounced off a wall behind the subject. And for the sake of time, I'm rushing through this. But the idea is, is that just by changing the placement of the flash, just by changing the direction of the flash, I was able to create light that was interesting on my subject in a room where otherwise the light would either be uninteresting or downright bad because it was unintentional. So, you know, I just picture if I had a family sitting on this couch, if I had a child sitting on this couch, just by moving that light around very quickly, I could create the kind of light that I would want to see as an artist on my subject. You're in control. So once you embrace the variables of light as the tools at your disposal, you can create the imagery of your dreams. You can, you know, from a simple portrait that highlights your best features to the most complex composite, anything's possible. Again, we like costumes. So again, complex composite the chickens weren't actually well not all of the chickens were in my kitchen at this time Um, but again using those variables of light makes it just that much more believable it creates a soft brotherly moment it creates mommy kissing santa claus and the tree illuminating their sweet little faces as they watch so in conclusion some simple exercises for learning to love flash learning to love light like i said flip through that magazine decode those light sources. Keep a light journal. I'm a huge fan of journaling, um, but pay attention to the way light falls in your home. Jot about how that light makes you feel and what pictures you might want to take in that light. Um, Jot down how you think you could recreate that light. Um, If you have a flash already, try to recreate natural light photo using the flash as your key light, your main light. Um, Photograph the same subject five times and only change the variables of light to try to create five very different images. 
You could create a thousand different images just changing the light, but I'm only going to make you do five. And finally, embrace failure. That if you take away nothing from this class, take away that. Embrace failure, failure because every time you fail, you're pushing yourself one step closer to success, one step closer to really knowing who you are as an artist. So if you're anything like me, you hate flash because you're used to shooting a certain way and you don't think flash will give you the results that you love, right? Like I loved those natural light photos and I was afraid that flash would ruin it. Um, you've seen it used badly too many times and you failed too many times, but what I hope I've showed you in our excruciatingly short period of time together is that flash can fall right in line with how you create now because you're already a light artist. You're a photographer. You paint with light and light is at the very foundation of what we do. And when we learn how to harness it, when we learn how to create it, we can get the results that we've come to love and so much more. Um, you know, we can't just get the technical, technical results we love, but we can get the emotional results that we want. Um, you know, we can use it with intention to convey a message and understanding light is just one more step toward understanding this amazing craft. And my hope for you is that through learning flash and learning about light, you'll learn to love photography that much more deeply. Um, and that you'll get that much closer to being the artist that you're meant to be. That's been my experience. And truly, I want that for each and every single person here. And that is it, man, I really rushed through it. Um, this is me <laughs> and, um, you know, I'm based in Columbus, Ohio and, um, but more importantly, this is my email, kelly at shutterandglass.com. I'm also just Kelly Beezer on Instagram. Whatever way is more, um, is easier for you to reach out. If you want that PDF, um, feel free. I will send it right your way um, so that you can watch those videos and hopefully digest this in a little bit longer time than the single hour that we're here together. I've had a blast and um, really appreciate Sammy's having me here this evening.